Good morning. Hey. Good morning, Joe. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, new haircut. Yep. And we're both wearing glasses this morning. Yeah, it's one of those tired mornings. Too and tired. You that beautiful young woman with you. How's she feeling this morning? Uh, a little bit better. Still uh, full of snot, but we're working on it. <laughs> hey. Well, we want to welcome uh, all of our friends and comrades to this week. We're doing it on Thursday today because tomorrow I'm traveling to my home state of Ohio. There is a, a convention on Sunday in Columbus uh, that we're having of the Ohio organization in preparation for our upcoming national convention, which by the way, will be streamed live uh, here on Facebook and on YouTube. So uh, just a quick question on that. Um, for people that might not be familiar with, with how the party uh, works, what is the, what is a state convention? How does it, um, what, does it do, what does it do? What's its role? Well, the party is uh, organized in what we call districts and clubs. And normally there's one district per state, but in a couple states, you know, given their size, like Pennsylvania or um, uh, California, you have two, two districts, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you can divide the state in half, Eastern PA and Western PA, with Philly and Pittsburgh centering uh, both. Uh, and the, but that's kind of a geographic explanation. Uh, politically, uh, the uh, state conventions uh, bring together the, the clubs and members in any given air, uh, area to discuss the work of the national committee in the preceding period to assess their own work and to put forward proposals for improving it, you know? Okay. Um, and um, some of them will elect their leadership for the uh, next uh, four years. Sometimes they do it before the convention, sometimes they do it afterward, depending on their uh, circumstances. So the purpose is to assess reflect, elect, okay. assess, reflect, elect. And we're very democratic by the way, um, contrary to, to uh, some people's uh, opinion, uh, we discuss all things out collectively and generally arrive at most decisions by consensus. You know, you were out there in Oregon recently and then yeah. also in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, how did they do it there? Um, so there it was uh, very much, well, as you said, um, open, democratic, things were uh, put to a vote. Um, you know, there, there was, um, there are different ways of, of choosing a, um, or of, of electing delegates. Some, some districts will, uh, the leadership will prepare a slate uh, in advance uh, based on, you know, comrades' political development, also keeping in mind, um, making sure that the, the delegates are representative of the, the multiracial uh, man and woman uh, working class. Um, uh, but also you know, in other districts will, um, you know, first kind of poll their members to see who would really like to be a delegate who's committed to going. Um, uh, right. Both Arizona and Oregon took that, that latter method, um, but in both cases came up with, uh, you know, with very solid uh, sets of delegates. There were, um, especially in the case of, of Arizona, um, uh, just a really rich and, and fruitful discussion about um, what the party had done in the past year, where it was going, especially around the Green New Deal. How was that going to change the world? It was really, it was really good to see. I, I'd only ever been to the, the Illinois uh, District Convention, so I was in yeah. Chicago. And we were at the uh, New York uh, Convention. And I was at the New York this year, which was- By the way, was streamed live uh, here yeah. on Facebook, and uh, you, know, you can look for it and find it uh, on our uh, page. So um, we are having a seminar, webinar coming up on Sunday that's going to deal with the role of the party, how we conceive of our role, um, and the battle of ideas. And there is the battle of ideas, you know, going on in this country. 
and um, it's rather fierce. Um, and socialism, socialism and the socialist, what socialism will. So that's a lot to put on the plate for uh, uh, an evening, but we're going to do it. And uh, yeah, I can't overestimate the importance of, of this particular discussion. Like, um, you know, the party, you know, if we really believe that the party has a role, that it's necessary, that it's, it's, that it exists for a purpose, um, we need to always be, you know, thinking about that purpose, adjusting it, figuring out um, how it looks in a specific set of political circumstances. Um, and really, I can't think of a, a more important discussion to be having in uh, the world we're living in right now, both you know, here in the United States and internationally. We need Marxist, revolutionary, communist um, leadership in all sorts of areas. And, and that's what we're, that's what we're putting out there. Yeah, well, you know, um, not only that, but we need that leadership to come from working class people, working class men and women. And that leadership to me in all aspects, political leadership, ideological leadership, intellectual, moral leadership, you know? I'm really interested in that. Can you explain a little bit about, um, because we, we don't usually think, we don't usually use the term moral in, in relation to sort of Marxist uh, theory or whatever, but, but I like the idea. So tell me more about the, the moral leadership of the working class. What are the values of the working class or the moral, uh, what's the moral character of it? Well, you know, aren't we fighting for a better world? Aren't you fighting for your daughter, you know? Um, and myself. And yourself. And uh, I'm told I don't have any children, but I'm told that when people have children, the worldview kind of shifts rather dramatically. And, um, uh, and, and, and we want a better life, you know? Um, and so in broad strokes, um, I think that... Uh, our, you know, moral framework is defined by what that better life would uh, look like, you know? And also by, by the needs of, of getting there. You know, when, when you first said like the moral leadership of the working class, like the working class people, you know, that I grew up with, um, my family, my, my town, uh, and I think a lot of other people have the same experience, like there's a, a value based on on solidarity and collectivity, um, an understanding that you know when when somebody in your community is hurting, you pitch in and you you figure out how to help them, and that's also I think a kind of moral yeah empathy yeah you know, um, love uh, rather than the kind of sociopathic pursuit of profits that the capitalists are uh, championing of uh, life both human, animal, and uh, life on earth, you know, uh, as a uh, kind of a universal value. It means opposition to the uh, death penalty. Yep. Not only now, but in the socialist future, we're not in favor. Uh, it means the abolition of prisons as we understand it now, you know. It means equality of, um, of uh, not only uh, opportunity, but equality of, um, how can I put it? Um, I don't wanna say ends, but I wanna say material conditions, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that uh, people are able to live and eat and, and uh, uh, have decent, housing and clothing and health care. And it also means that that, um, that those things can't be, those are matters of, of principle that, that can't be compromised. Sim you know, human dignity is uh, an absolute in a certain sense. And it can't be, you know, limited or, or shunted aside or dismissed simply because achieving it is difficult. And that's the the revolutionary. Absolutely. I heard Herbert Abthecker come to speak when I was in college and he said, 
The main thing that the Marxists are arguing for is the dignity of man and woman, the dignity of man and woman. And if anybody tells you different, they don't know what the hell they're doing, <laughs> very dramatic kind of. Yeah. Uh, you don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> And, nice. um, you can't be dignified if you don't have health care. Yep. You can't be dignified um, uh, if you don't um, have uh, a job, you know? You can't be dignified if, you know, your boss can uh, treat you like shit and you have no choice but to accept it because Listen. the alternative is not yeah. being, you know. All of those things. And so we're, we're, we believe that the, uh, a, a, a new morality and a new intellectual life and a new culture is already present in the working class and that it's up to us to nurture it and develop it and promote it, you know? And, um, and that is part of what the Communist Party is all about, you know? And not just for ourselves, but in general, you know? Um, yeah. So that even if, workers aren't members of our organization in our coalition relationships um, and our personal relationships, you know, we're constantly striving to bring forward that leadership so that uh, the means of getting there will help determine the end result that we uh, reach. And no other party says that, mm -hmm. you know, um, and no other party has a worldview that is premised on, you know, a scientific analysis of how to make that possible. Yeah, there, there are plenty of parties that recognize there's something wrong with the world. There are even, you know, a fair number that recognize that capitalism is the problem and, you know, we need to think differently or whatever. But um, aside from, from communist parties, who else is, is saying that you know, there is a way to change it and um, we need to bring forth the working class leadership that will um, enable the transformation of society. I, no one else that I know of. One of the ways to gain that working class leadership is by having um, paid family leave, uh, which is, you know, so that um, after a child is born or whatever, you know, people have an opportunity to go home and take care of business and 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 be paid. And and the only country in one of the few, I don't know if it's the only country, but one of the few countries in the world where that is ours. Mm. And that's what we're promoting this week. There's a there's a bill in Congress uh, demanding paid family leave, and uh, we support it. So please come to our website and check out our Facebook page and uh, find out about how you can identify uh, with it. Yeah, and, and speaking of the, on the issue of dignity, um, my, my wife is a, a physician and she's told me about cases she's seen where, where mothers have had to go back to work after, after two weeks. You know, you have, your, you, you have your newborn at home for two weeks and then you, you know, you're back to working full time, which is not only, you know, destructive to, to health and, and, you know, possibly harmful to the newer, but also just really psychologically and emotionally traumatizing. Yeah. Uh, if I'd had to, like, two weeks after Lucia was born, if, if Corey or I had had to go back to work, it would have been horrible. Exactly, exactly. That's why we have to continue, continue to uh, fight for it. So it looks like um, the president must be your president, because he ain't mine. <laughs> well, I didn't vote for him. Continuing this bellicose policy in the uh, Middle East uh, uh, against Iran and uh, against Venezuela. And uh, so I, I think that your prediction last week that uh, there's been a shift is proving more and more true. Um, and um, do you think it's related to how they perceive their electoral prospects? I, I think so. For, for Trump in particular, the, um, like he needs to be able to go to his base in 2020 and say, um, you know, this is, this is what I did. I, you know, stood up to such and such a, a country. I, 
you know, uh, thought on this and that. He wants to look effective um, and he wants to look powerful and that whole thing. And he's also surrounded by people who, you know, have a very long running agenda, like Bolton and Pompeo have wanted um, war with Iran for, for a long time. Um, uh, so, the, you know, things, things are accelerating um, and w which kind of brings out the need for, again, for communist, for a communist perspective um, in sort of in the peace movement or in the response to this, because honestly, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party, even some of the best sectors of the Democratic Party are not really that strong on peace and on anti-imperialism. Now, before you go forward and talk about the best sectors, we want to encourage everybody who's watching to have a little watch party. You can uh, go to the bottom of the uh, of the uh, this uh, production and click on "Have I Want to Watch Party," and you can invite your friends to view the uh, show. And we do want to encourage you to uh, do that. Uh, but speaking of the best sections of the Democratic Party, it looks like your your uh, homeboy uh, Joe Biden is oh. leading the leading the Democratic presidential pack. I think I need a T-shirt that says Joe Biden is not my homeboy. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, I one of the so in the national board, the most electable. Huh? In the national board last night, one of the. Um, agenda items was was presentations uh, for in preparation for the webinar this this Sunday the seminar um, and there one of the comrades gave a really great presentation saying that we need to be talking to people about issues like candidates are important we got to vote it's it's a it's a way of of getting and holding a measure of power building infrastructure all of that but we're not going to like we don't educate people and, and mobilize people by, by saying, you know, who's the best candidate? Who do you, who do you want? Who, who's the most electable, whatever. Uh, talk to them about issues and candidates have to come out of that. That's my, I, I agree with that approach anyway. I don't know if. Well, but you're sidestepping the question that I asked, which was Biden is leading the pack. Yeah. And it looks like he's the most, uh, at least some people are saying that he's the most electable. And, um, and I guess they're identifying with the issues that he is, you know, putting, I don't know what those issues are, but. Um, so electability is a weird thing though, right? Because if you think about the, the sort of, response to the Clinton campaign in 2016, before, look in the primaries, it was, and in the general, well, in the primaries, it was, you know, she's the most electable. She's the only one that can beat Trump. She's the, you know, um, and then afterward, it turned out that she was not. She might've been the most electable, but she wasn't electable, uh, certainly. Not, and not at all to discount the fact that there was a a huge sex, like decades long sexist campaign against her that poisoned. True, you can't, you can't, uh, can't uh, deny that. So I'm also, but I, I think there's a tendency to, I don't like the tendency of anointing people in advance of saying, you know, oh, this person is the savior. This is, you know, be it Joe Biden, be it Bernie Sanders, be it whoever, like um, don't anoint people. like. Primaries are supposed to have a function. Let them work. And so if it's if if Joe Biden is the one who can capture the uh, hearts and minds of the American people, then Well Elizabeth Warren seems seems to be doing a little bit better. And uh, O'Rourke seems to be nowhere. They um, he said he was born to run, but it looks like he might be running for the exit. <laughs> <laughs> That is yeah, well, well, see, that's, but that's the prime example of, you know, one of these, um, like he was, he was the first one to be anointed. Like he was the chosen. The chosen uh, one. That's what they said about uh, Mr. Obama, Oprah Winfrey. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is that Obama had uh, wind at his back and he had support and, among, and, and yeah. after even after, and, and when he won the Iowa primary, the support, which was already building in the African-American community just exploded. And, uh, after that, it was all she wrote, you know, it, it, uh, he, he was on his way to the nomination and had a mass movement behind him. I think it's too early to tell. Yeah. Too soon to tell and uh, it's and, gonna take a broad, big tent coalition. For and on the Obama question, one of the things that made him so successful was that his campaign was able to bring in huge numbers of people who'd never voted before. Yes. So youth, a huge mobilization in the African-American community. Um, and I think that's a, that's a lesson for 2020. Like, it's not, you know, people talk about, like, oh, should we be going for women? Should we be going for, like, low-income people? Should we be going for, you know, unions? Should we be going for, yes, 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 and yes. But mostly you should be going for expanding the franchise, making sure that everybody who votes can vote. But isn't the question for what purpose? I mean, at the end of the day, something has gone wrong. You know, the, the, the neoliberal model that both shaped the Roosevelt through the Reagan period, uh, well, that wasn't neoliberal, but the, um, what's the name of the economist, the Keynesian model, and the neoliberal model that shaped the uh, period from Trump, I'm sorry, Reagan until, working mm -hmm. you know that paradigm economic is not working and so the question is in what will real change consist because you know the politics as usual you know people got all upset when you know some of the promises that of real change that were offered mm -hmm. you know despite the best intentions, weren't delivered. Yeah. So, I mean, so I, this is, uh, and that was no like, huh? Sorry, I gotta put this baby down here. Okay. She is uh, kind of signaling the end of our program yeah. too. We've been going at it for about 20 minutes, but share your thought and then we'll try to wrap um, it up. Yeah, just, just um, you know, uh, all the way back in 1905, uh, Lenin, you know, warned about the, the inability of even the most democratically minded section of the capitalist class to deliver on its promises, right? They're, they're, no matter what their intentions are, no matter how pure, whatever, they are bound by property. They need to protect capitalist property rights. And that limit, that means they rely on things like prisons and the police and all the undemocratic apparatus. Um, so coming back to kind of where we, an earlier moment in the discussion, it's, Lenin says only the working class can fight for democracy all the way to the end, um, past all the inconsistencies. And So maybe the socialist moment and discussions that we're in is actually signaling that if Keynesian has reached its outer limit, and if neoliberalism has reached its outer limit, and if there is an environmental existential crisis, and there is, you know, we it's need to be for a new model about taking it to the stage, taking it to the socialist stage. As absolutely, it well, uh, we got to defeat Trump to get there. So, thank you very much. Uh, have a great week, everybody. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday. What time is it? Six o'clock? Uh, seven o'clock? I believe it's uh, seven o'clock. We'll send out a we'll send out a notice and we'll put it on Facebook. Uh, Check us out. It's going to be a very interesting conversation, and uh, we're going. And to Joe's be, one of the facilitators. You know, throwing stones, uh, soft ones. You know, <laughs> want to stimulate the conversation. All right, take right. care. Take Thanks. care. Talk to you later. Bye bye.